Okay, hello and welcome everyone. So in this video, I'm gonna do a walkthrough of two exercises that basically give us practice thinking about being able to represent preferences in a utility function based on a statement in terms of a verbal representation of, of that individual's preferences. Right, so we've got two here. Whoops, <laughs> didn't mean to show us the answer just yet. Uh, now, now you know what Mr. Rogers is doing here, right? Anyway, so uh, Howard is always willing to trade one pack of Pokemon cards for two packs of gum. If Pokemon cards are good one, gum is good two, draw Howard's indifference curves. Write a utility function to represent Howard's preferences. And then two, Dudley insists on consuming three graham crackers with each glass of milk. If graham crackers are good one and milk is good two, draw Dudley's indifference curves. Write down a utility function to model Dudley's preferences. All right, so let me, you could stop the video, kind of work on modeling out the preferences and the utility function for yourself, right? And then, uh, yeah, I had the answer right here and I was trying to move it around and like copy paste or whatever, but um, my graphs kept moving, like the lines stopped lining up. And so then I remembered, oh, when I was a little kid, I watched this episode of Mr. Rogers and Mr. Rogers toured a graham cracker factory. So you can go and find this actually, right? So it's a mrrogers.org and you can see the time that Mr. Rogers toured the graham cracker factory. Uh, the, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood was made in Pittsburgh, and the Graham Cracker Factory, right, would have been, like, local to Pittsburgh. I don't think it's there anymore. I think they shut that one down. But I think one of my internet rabbit holes had had me exploring what had happened here. And one of the reasons why they wanted to make Graham Crackers there in the first place, if I recall correctly, was that the water that was from the Three Rivers area was, like, really conducive to making good-tasting Graham Crackers. So anyway, so kind of verify or see if, I don't know, maybe you have zero more interest in graham crackers than to solve this problem, but you can kind of go and explore that if that is fascinating. All right, let's go over the solution now. So yeah, this stuff is moving around. Anyway, so uh, the first one, Howard is willing to trade one pack of Pokemon cards for two packs of gum. I put gum on the vertical. I put Pokemon cards on the horizontal, right? Good one and good two. And actually, like what this is saying, willing to trade one for two, I'm starting down here where I have one and I'm willing to give up the one that I have. Now I've got zero and I'm given two packs of gum and I'm just as good, right? So that's the idea. You're always, always willing to trade one for two. Um, yeah, because it says we're always willing to trade one for two, we're expecting this is going to be perfect substitutes preferences, right? We're trading off at a constant rate. And it's actually really important that it says always willing to trade one pack, right? Always, this implies indeed, we're willing to trade off one for the other at a constant rate. And in particular, when I read this, one of the big things this is picking up on is it doesn't matter how many of either I have at the present time. I'm always willing to trade off at this rate, right? That's very different from like our standard well-behaved or like Cobb Douglas preferences where your marginal rate of substitution is going to depend on how much of the good that you have, right? Think about think about if you have a really uh, steep portion of the indifference curve or a really flat portion of the, of the indifference curve and how that's pertaining to the relative quantities or the amounts of the two goods um, occurring at that position on that indifference curve. Well, that's not relevant here. You're always willing to trade one for two, right? And so we represent this with with uh, straight line, you know, constant rate of um, constant transaction or constant um, constant trade off in difference curves. All right, whatever. So once we've got our slope here, now we've got to figure out exactly what's going to be uh, what's going to be the utility function that's going to correspond to these preferences. So I'm thinking carefully about what's going on here. This is telling me I'm giving up two to receive one implies the slope is minus two. To be able to get indifference curves with a slope of minus two, right, we want to think about, well, perfect substitutes, preferences, the, the marginal utility of good one divided by the marginal utility of good two has to be two in this case, right? Oh, oh yeah, so the sign, right? So remember the note from Varian that says, like, let's not worry too much about the negative sign. You know, sometimes we'll just report marginal rate of substitution in absolute value. Um, the sooner in your intermediate microeducation that you become okay with this, the better, right? So the idea is, yeah, look, we know these indifference curves have a negative slope, fine. Also, when we write down the utility function, yeah, we're going to write this with a positive, and the marginal utility of good one is two, the marginal utility of good two is one, and the MRS is two. Even though we know it's negative, we're reporting this in absolute value, right? Because corresponding to these indifference curves, but one of the reasons why we kind of are like always want to talk in terms of 
um, absolute value is because firstly, like it gets cumbersome to think about like putting a negative here. Uh, also, um, if we think about when we're ultimately doing optimization, we're going to be comparing this marginal rate of substitution, which is corresponding to downward sloping and difference curves, to a price ratio, which is corresponding to a generally down, downward sloping budget constraint. And those negative signs cancel. Anyway, so uh, here, yeah, indeed, the marginal utility of good one is two, right? The first, the, the partial derivative with respect to x1 is two. Partial derivative with respect to x2 is one. Ratio of those marginal utilities, right? MU1 divided by MU2, that's two, right? So the MRS, marginal rate of substitution, is two in this case. And here's my note. Yeah, this utility function is non-unique. This could just as easily be a monotone transformation of the above. I don't know. Maybe you wrote this down as like 4x1 plus 2x2. That's just as good, right? What would be a mistake? Well, it'd be a mistake to have x1 plus 2x2, right? At least given these labeling conventions for the axes, that would be a, that would be a problem, right? Okay, so now let's look at good two, or let's look at exercise two. Dudley insists on consuming three graham crackers with each glass of milk, right? So insists on consuming three graham crackers with each glass of milk. This implies fixed proportions. So we're expecting these goods are going to be complements. We're going to have these nice like right angle preferences. And the way that I always like thinking about like backing out exactly how to draw the line and everything and how to, I'll explain that in a second, and then how to come up with the utility representation. I always like starting out with a list of all the acceptable bundles, right? So if Dudley's cool with like three graham crackers and one glass of milk, it's got to be fine with like six graham crackers and two glasses of milk or nine and three or whatever, right? So these are like all the bundles that Dudley's okay with. So now basically you're probably thinking about the type of utility function that's going to give us these preferences and like more or less you're probably going to be thinking about something like this so your question is really like should it be minimum of x1 and 3x2 or should it be minimum of 3x1 and x2 right so here's how i always try to figure this out is i go back and i test actually the first bundle from my list that they that they're happy with consuming right this 3 1 and i say all right let's let me try this last one let's try the second one uh, where my utility is from the minimum of 3x1 and x2, right? So let's evaluate this at the bundle 3, 1. If I do this, it's going to be the minimum of 3 times 3. That's 9 and 1, right? Minimum of 9 and 1 is just 1. What that's telling us is that that's actually really wasteful, especially realizing that we're having to expend resources to get good 1 and good 2, right? Here, we're, we've... We've expended more resources on graham crackers than is contributing to our utility because, right, we need a lot of glasses of milk to make up for it. And notice what's happened, though. We actually have a problem, which is like with fixed proportion utility, we would expect that in order to get better off, you have to have more of both and more of both in the same fixed proportion. What happens if this is the utility representation and we give Dudley one more glass of milk, right? Now Dudley's utility goes from... Dudley's utility would go from one to two. What if we give a third glass of milk? Now it's going from one to two to three, right? Dudley's utility is rising if we if we increase the amount of milk, you know, and w while holding constant our three graham crackers. That can't happen. That's a violation of this statement right here, right? So clearly, this cannot be the correct utility. This cannot be the correct utility function. Uh, utility of good one, good two is like minimum of three x one x two. Can't be that one. Let's try this other one. Yeah, it's right, but let's try it. So um, again, the same point: three graham crackers and one glass of milk. The minimum of three and three times one. Right. This is three glasses of milk. Up. Oh, maybe I could even put my put my parentheses around here. Cool. And then here's like to indicate that we're evaluating x one at three, and here we're evaluating x two at or value in the utility function where x2 is 1. Anyway, so the minimum utility is going to be, or utility is going to be the, the smaller of both sides here. Oh, it's 3 in both cases. And what happens if we give Dudley another glass of milk and no more, no addition graham crackers? Well, now the utility is still 3, right? Because if we get another glass of milk, this is going to be 3 times 2, that's 6. Oh, but utility didn't rise because it's going to be the utility is coming from whichever is the smaller of these two. You got an extra glass of milk, but you only had three graham crackers, right? So your utility is still at three. And this captures exactly the idea of perfect complements preferences, to be able to reach a higher level of 
higher indifference curve, you've got to have more of both in the same fixed proportion as is desired. Okay, so this is the correct utility function. And my last comment here is, look, you can replace this comma with an equal sign. And this is going to be important. Ultimately, like the way that we'll solve this is, we'll, firstly, we'll replace the comma. The way that we'd solve the optimization problem is we replace the comma with an equal sign here and solve for x2. That's going to give me the line. This is x2 equals 1 third x1, right? This is the line through the corners. And so this now leads us kind of out of this exercise because we asked this in, the, in this class uh, and now thinking about optimization. So all the optimal bundles have to lie on the corners here, right? Otherwise you've got wasted resources. Otherwise you've got some kind of problem like we had up here, right? So all the optimal bundles have to lie on these corners. So we actually would want it to cross any budget constraint that we're subject to at the corner. And therefore, because we're thinking of like where let me just steal this indifference curve and make this a budget constraint. <laughs> All right, so suppose this is my budget constraint. Ultimately, I'm trying to solve for this point right here. Solve a system of equations. Basically, you'd, you'd substitute in the, uh, you'd solve, you know, solve for where, the, where this line through these corners crosses the budget constraint. So I could actually substitute into my budget constraint uh, this relationship right here. And then that would give me my optimal bundle. And that is exactly how, how you'd solve if I gave you a budget constraint and you're trying to find the optimal bundle. So sorry, I realize it's getting a little bit ahead of what we were doing, but since I was just like mentioning like what's the point of doing this, I've got other videos where I'll show that solution and maybe even like the exercise that I'll make for class will kind of extend this one. If so, then I'll cop I'll I'll uh, paste that link in the comments or in the discussion of this video, and then you'll have that as well. But Anyway, so here are these two exercises plus two bonus portions. One interesting fact about Mr. Rogers' neighborhood history and then also thinking about how to solve the optimization problem version of this. Anyway, I hope you liked the video. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll catch you in the next one. Bye for now.